so much to all three of our speakers. If I may now invite you to come to the uh, table here, and I'll introduce our moderator uh, momentarily. So please come on up and have a seat. So yes, we're going to move on to the moderated discussion portion of uh, the event. And uh, to moderate our discussion, we are very pleased to have Professor Anna Ruda Das, who is Associate Professor of Neuroscience, a prin principal investigator at Columbia's Zuckerman Institute, and a member of the Kavli Institute for Brain Science. Um, Professor Das's lab is interested in uh, cortical mechanisms of visual processing with two broad areas of research, understanding task-related anticipation in visual cortex and analyzing the cortical basis of visual form processing. The lab is also actively involved in developing new recording and analysis techniques for these two research directions. And we're very pleased to have Professor Das here uh, as a neuroscientist to moderate this discussion. And without further ado, please welcome Professor Das. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I'm, I'm also really pleased to see the, the, the wonderful turnout for this. Thanks, thanks to all the speakers who, uh, in, in many ways, have made my task much easier because, I mean, rather than you know, my having to, uh, to propose grand ideas, or uh, it's really, uh, it, it would be a much richer discussion simply taking off from points that they have raised, and uh, maybe that would lead to, 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 to just sort of pushing on points that they have brought up, and that, that would, be, would be interesting for us all to explore further. So just in, in the order in which uh, the people had spoken, I, I'll start with Peter. And uh, I wanted to push further. You know, in many ways, uh, the, the way I see the, the contours of what the three of you have done, even though, Jesse, you started off saying that uh, you are a neuroskeptic, but you you presented for the, the, the largest fraction of what your work, uh, of what you spoke of, was really um, undergirding the value of uh, a neuroscience approach. Uh, so I want to, I would like to get to that. Uh, Suzanne, you uh, started, you know, you have given more of a, you could say, utilitarian value of uh, neuroscience approach, but I do want to push on that because I want to understand where the neuroscience comes in. But to start with you, Peter, uh, you did say uh, that as a sociologist, you're not interested in what specific areas of the brain do, and it doesn't really it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether the amygdala is interested in fear or value or, uh, you know, or I, I forget which specific area you're talking about but, uh, of, of action and so on. So in that case, I would like to push you further on what you think can be learned by even this very cool finding that after you have corrected for uh, so various you know, various factors. You the the, the brain um, response measured at time one predicts liking at time two. You know, take it on from there. So uh, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so I should you know I should be really clear. Um, what I wanted to say, uh, I am not particularly interested in what parts of brains are doing what. Um, I think what I wanted to say is a lot of what we call what's happening in some regions is arising from experimental designs that are, are structured so as they can't see uh, some sorts of phenomenon, um, like the one that we've induced. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, it's more revelatory to think of activation in the so-called reward region as actually relevant for, um, for the problem that it expresses itself in our study, which is social navigation and, and, under, and um, the generation and the building of a social structure. So maybe I didn't say very clearly, we in sociology, we know that, that social structures take on characteristics, char characteristic forms, and we have actually very powerful models for describing the emergence of those, pro of those forms. Uh, 
We have very powerful models for thinking about tie formation and tie dissolution. Some of them, some of them are, are psychological in their foundation insofar as they invoke balance and the, the central idea that people strive to reduce dissonance in their social relations and that the pursuit of balance leads to the structures that we observe. So we, what's happening in this paper is that net of every single sociological driver of the tie formation and tie dissolution process that gives rise to the characteristic feature of, of group social structures as they evolve over time, net of that, we can observe this very powerful signature very early on um, in the interaction sequence that months later expresses itself um, as a very complex emotional state called liking, which we didn't really get into. So to me, what, what this add, you know, you said, well, what does this add? Um, it adds an enormously powerful explanatory um, uh, factor that we've simply never understood about how social groups assume the characteristic forms they do. Now you can, you can say, well, we don't know what it is. It's just a black box. You know, it's, it's some form of activation. Even worse, it's measured by an fMRI, which we know, you know, doesn't actually have the temporal resolution to measure anything and so on. Well, you know, it's a black box of some sort, but what, and you know, this is a single group that we've been able to do this in because no one's ever tried to do this before. But, um, I think it's not so much of a black box if we go back to thinking more deeply about why it is that our brains are doing what they're doing and what the human brain must have been able, must have been evolved to do is to solve fundamental social problems. So that, that there's a, 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 a um, capacity in the human brain to read, read social structures in advance of their generation um, is super fascinating. Um, so I don't know if that's an adequate question to you, but from a sociological point of view, it's actually explaining um, a mystery that we really haven't been able to explain, although we imagined we had a pretty good set of models for it. But uh, so, so do you think that would, I mean, in what way would that inform uh, well, I'm still, I, I, I hey, don't I'll want to put try, you on the spot. I'll try yeah. one more thing, yeah. because actually it's related to something Jesse said. So I think he's wrong, by the way, that you can't do this for sociality. But, um, but we collect data on multiple kinds of relations that people have. So liking is a very complex relation. In, in, some, in some settings, when you ask people what, what it is, what are the set of adjectives that underlie liking or disliking, um, in, some sen in some settings, the adjectives of competence, logic, efficiency um, come up as heavily undergirding positive liking and sentiments like helplessness, um, uh, depressed, uh, anxious uh, uh, are undergirding the disliking side of liking. Um, whereas in other contexts, very different things undergird liking. So liking itself is a very sociological rich, rich um, rich emotional state. But we collect data on lots of different relations. We have liking, and then we have a whole array of what we would think in sociology as, as instrumental relations, that if liking is an affective relation, we have a set of instrumental relations like, like um, being influenced by, influencing, helping, and trusting, and so on. And, and it's quite interesting to, to observe that, um, that the time one neural response across those relations is quite different, um, and that it actually reflects time two social structure more accurately than time one actual explicit responses, which for me suggests, and you know, I don't know if there's any foundation to this, that there's actually a fundamental neural partition between instrumentality and affective relations. And, and if that's true, that's interesting sociologically. Um, real social groups confuse those all the time. You know, the, the thing about real humans is they make a mess of, you know, the purity of, of the disjointness of relations that we can analytically separate in real life. But if it's true that there are these variations that are organized in, in with respect to our neural response to people, it's fascinating. Yeah, even though this is supposed to be, the, the first part of this is supposed to be uh, a sort of a moderated discussion, I think it'll be a richer, uh, a richer discussion if there are people from questions from the audience, yeah?
Uh, Daphne? Hi, thanks. Um, so I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, and I'm interested in cognition and cognitive aspects of neuroscience. And I'm curious about the listening to a conversation about um, one of three neuroscientists in the room listening to non-neuroscientists discuss the value of neuroscience for their fields, um, which reminds me sadly a little bit like being, which happens a lot, one of two women in a large room of scientists wondering how to think about the changes in the roles of women in science. So I'm gonna, um, I guess I've learned to be bold and I'm gonna weigh in. Um, so I, I just wanted to note a few um, factual corrections. Uh, and one is that, um, I have to say, as somebody who studies the stratum, the only place I've heard people call the stratum the reward region this frequently is in these sorts of contexts. Uh, so we wouldn't do that. Um, I think that's uh, uh, maybe a useful simplification and approximation outside of the field, but not what people in the field do. Um, and the reason is because we know in the field that you can't put any word or label on any part of the brain. Um, and, that, and that that's misleading. So I think, that's, uh, I think that raises, other than kind of the rebuttal aspect of it, I think it just raises the challenge of translating deep nuanced knowledge to other fields so that that knowledge can be useful but not appear to be ridiculous as um, it had appeared to be uh, earlier today. Um, the second kind of thing which I just couldn't leave untouched was the dead salmon um, because as I'm sure you're aware, the point of that was to show how flawed analyses lead to false conclusions. So when you were sort of saying you think you've done something more than that, I hope you've done something very different from that um, because that is uh, a tale of how uh, a very uh, young and new field that's very complex makes mistakes and calls itself out on those mistakes, which I think is, uh, is good. Um, the third thing I want to mention, maybe more than any, uh, anything else, is really this idea that I think in the discussion today there was a, a kind of a point uh, that neuroscience equals brain imaging, and I think that's really um, inaccurate, uh, misguided, and confusing, and, and, and sort of makes us all miss the opportunity to connect with a very rich a field that for which brain imaging is sort of the newest blip on the radar and uh, maybe an exciting one and I use you know brain imaging in my own work but it's new and we're just figuring it out and I think it's uh, it's a shame not to connect to other modes of analysis and particularly with a social network so Daniel Saltzman here at Columbia has really interesting work in monkeys it's a you know it's not human it's a reductive model but it's about social networks and I think it's those multiple levels that we can connect with um, that make those connections useful. Um, and so one area where I think those connections have been made in a useful way, for example, is in the field of memory, which, which is my field, but, uh, so I know, I know it particularly well, but also I think it highlights that when we have, as in the field of memory, all those different levels available to us because there's been detailed work and it's easier to bridge with animals, then we can do it in a more sophisticated way and bridge to other disciplines, which I think is enormously uh, important. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, I think kind of choosing, picking on neuroaesthetics is almost, you know, really a cheap shot, as I think you, you yourself said, because that's an area where we don't have precise behavioral measures, we don't have good cognitive psychology, and so yeah, if some people will stick those people in the scanner and try to, that's going to be the, kind of the weakest link, but there are on the other side many, many strong links in many areas where neuroscience has clearly changed theories in cognitive psychology and other disciplines, and I think we're really just scratching the surface. Um, so all that to say that I think, you know, the reason so many people are here and the reason I'm here is because we think these cross-discipline conversations are really important, but also because we think that these, you know, the ability to stand here and talk, to socialize, to have consciousness, we think it's happening in the brain and even though neuroscience might not resolve all the questions, we think it has something to bear on them. So I'll just be brief. Um, the dead salmon thing, maybe you missed it, was a joke. Um, there's a lot of cognitive and social neuroscience that identifies the regions of the brain that we are working on um, as reward. I think there are hundreds of papers that, that use that language. Um, so um, you're absolutely right. Um, if, if this was a longer presentation than 14 minutes, um, there'd probably be more nuance in, in thinking about what's actually happening in those regions and other regions. Um, but I think I was trying to make another point, and maybe I'll just try one more time, which is, 
Um, if you're interested, as I am, in, in social phenomenon, then, um, design, so, then social research or research that's interested in social phenomenon ought to try as best as possible not to abstract the subjects of the research from the settings in which the thing we're interested in observing is, can be observed, but actually to figure out how to embed uh, them in, back into those settings. Now, I agree that showing people pictures of their social network members in a scanner is not exactly the same as being at a cocktail party. It's not, it's not the same, but it's closer than, in my mind, than, sent, than showing them images of abstracted concepts um, that you're trying to capture, in this case, affective uh, uh, liking, or in other papers that we've written on uh, status or popularity. And I think those are my two comments. Great. So thanks, Daphne. Very, very quickly. Hi. Just a very quick last question, if possible. Hey, guys, back here. Oh. I already have the mic. Okay. Can I just <laughs> yeah, uh, just... Do, do, you, do you mind if... You, uh, yeah. could, we, could we have... Yeah, okay. Could we have Jesse's response? And then we can come back to... Just, just sure, I'll, I'll be quick. But first, I, I mean, am I a neuroskeptic? Yes, and I'm a philosophy skeptic and a psychology skeptic. I'm especially an experimental philosophy skeptic. I think we should be skeptical about methodology. I think it's healthy, and I think their solution is we'd all agree to touch all parts of the elephant at once. So I, it's really just a plea for, for pluralism. On Reward Center, come on. I mean, look, I don't read anyone who cites neuroscience other than neuroscientists. Reward Center is used constantly. I, I mentioned the striatum once. It was in context of Tanya Zinger's study where she uses that language for, for the nucleus accumbens. I, I, I agree, that's really a problem with social neuroscience. Uh, yes, uh, but with, let, let, let with respect to field pluralism, I mean, I, I did cite multiple um, uh, electrophysiology studies. That there was at one point a, 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 a TMS study. There were, you know, scalp recordings. So, I mean, I, I'm a big believer in that the field is much better than bold and bigger than bold. And so I agree that that's a very important corrective. We, those of us, especially in the humanities, should not just read uh, uh, scientific American reports of an fMRI study. Uh, that would be that would be a big um, mistake. On aesthetics, no, I mean aesthetics. There's wonderful work in behavioral aesthetics. There are two journals dedicated to it. It's one of the oldest topics in the history of psychology. Wund and Feschner wrote monograph length treatments of aesthetics. There, there's tremendously good work being done on the behavior of our interest in the arts and the psychology of the arts, and not just visual art, but music, dance, and other things. And the neuroscience will catch up. It is it is getting there. So it is an easy easy target. I, I basically agree with, with everything you say, and it's really just a plea for exactly that, being, being cautious, not taking the, the simplest stuff as our, our model, and being um, open to correction. But I do think, with respect to the claim that cognitive neuroscience doesn't label, I do think um, there is a lot of labeling. There is a disciplinary um, commitment to trying to review what brain structures do, and in the discussion sections of papers, you often say, see people saying, well, you know, here's what other things this structure does. And those lists are much more informative uh, than any of, the, any of the labeling. The method for doing that hasn't been systematized. And there's a lot of cherry picking. So it'd be great to see, the, as the discipline matures, more systematic efforts to think about doing a functional profile uh, to get the functional anatomy to be more nuanced than it currently is. Mm -hmm. There was a question back there. Yeah, I just had. Look, a couple of very quick questions. Um, one, I'd really love to hear your points of view on the Alexander Huth study, neuroreplication using fMRI, and the implications that that has on particularly uh, limbic system theory and how what we know about what happens in the limbic system versus what the estimations are, also from a social theory perspective. So that's kind of one. And then the second point, which I'd really love to get the panel's view on, is that around neuroreplication in relation to machine learning, particularly reinforcement learning, and the implications that that can have on proving some of the existing theory in the field. They're yours. <laughs> I think it's for you. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know if I can come. I mean, I, um, I don't have an opinion. I, I would say, I mean, there. I am skeptical about the so-called replication crisis. Uh, I think it's been, been greatly inflated. I think it's led to some improvements in the discipline, like prediction vaults and all of that, and you, you know, using power analysis to get sample sizes. 
most neuro, uh, cognitive neuro studies are grossly underpowered. And I think we still have very kind of undeveloped from a, just a, a methods perspective understanding of what we're looking at with respect to what, how do you do effect size with neuroscience, how do you do p-value, what does significance testing even mean with small samples. So there's a lot of kinks to be um, worked out. But um, I do think it's in the nature of science that replication failure is part of the practice. And what happens is if you get an interest result, an interesting result, other labs will try and do it and they'll sometimes fail. We do need to worry about file drawers and there should be more openness to publishing failed replications, though I think there are hazards there. So just it, because I don't, I don't do, I, I do behavioral science as it, when I'm doing science, uh, not neuroscience. I just think there are people more expert in the room to comment on what to do in, in those particular cases. Obviously, limbic system as a theoretical construct has been under attack uh, for, for some decades. And as somebody who thinks that crosstalk between brain structures is the norm, I don't think some of those those constructs are, are particularly hopeful, helpful to hold on to. So, so, so I wanted to well, since 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 mm -hmm. uh, both of you by uh, by uh, have have had this uh, have had to defend your position and have had to ex to expand on them, um, I wanted to uh, turn to Suzanne. I wanted to push you somewhat on. You know, you gave a very nice uh, and detailed explanation of the of the approach of the clinical approach that you that you've taken within this this larger social and family um, context. Uh, where does neuroscience fit into that? So I appreciate the question because it's one I've asked myself a lot. And I will say that, you know, as Lan earlier sort of mentioned, we all we all are here because we have or hope to venture beyond what is is sort of a uh, you know the, the the tight confines of a particular discipline, I think. And so I think what's helpful in that context, that, and I've experienced this very much myself, I think that puts you in a position, the moment you do that, you're in a position of great vulnerability, is my experience. Because um, you're opening yourself up to languages and, and, and models and, and things that are less familiar. And so I think in that environment, that balance between curiosity and criticism, I think should weigh more heavily towards curiosity. So I'll, I'll sort of make a plea for that. Um, Jesse mentioned um, mirror neurons um, in your study, and I appreciated that because as someone who was sort of at one time a neuroscience researcher, I'm not now, I may be again in the future, um, I've never known what to do with mirror neurons. And there was uh, a, lot of, a lot of resources and money and time has gone into studying that. It's been studied in context to those uh, uh, with autism. And as, as in some way trying to explain the deficit in autism. And I've, I will say that as a neurologist, I've been very selective in what and how I review and what I choose from the neuroscience research literature to incorporate into practice. Um, and so I'll give maybe one example, and it's, it's not an imaging study, but it's uh, a study that involves cognitive neuroscience. Um, it's a study out of uh, University of Pittsburgh by a group led by the neurologist Nancy Minshew. And what they did was uh, largely, they designed a study largely in response to what they felt was a deficit in the behavioral therapeutic approaches that are being applied to autism. And they did a study where they, um, they had a, a group of uh, neurotypical individuals and then a group of uh, adults with autism. And they trained them in tasks that were very discreet. Um, so, as an example, one of the tasks that the groups were trained in was to, it, within a visual field. They were uh, trained to identify uh, as quickly as possible bars, there were a series of bars in the field, bars that were of, um, the, uh, of a different direction. Okay, so a very discrete task, as quickly as you can, identify the bars in a field that are a different direction and identify uh, where those are. And they found that in those with autism, the more they were drilled in the discrete task, the harder and the less capable they were at similar but related tasks, whereas indivi neurotypical individuals were able to generalize and became better at other related tasks. Um, so they referred to that as overspecificity, and they suggested that the very uh, rigid techniques that had been applied to, to behavioral intervention for those with autism might be contributing to the rigid behaviors that were being seen later on in adolescence and adulthood. That it was iatrogenic, so it was a consequence of the therapy rather than a consequence of the condition. And so for me, that's a very important, what, and 
you know, very important cognitive uh, uh, science study and has very real and important implications. So we do draw from, from those uh, types of findings as much as possible. What are this is not, yeah, now it's on. Hi, Jessica Siegel. I'm a journalism professor at NYU, and I cover science and uh, health. And I was very intrigued uh, by what are the outcomes of narrative, the narrative-oriented therapy. And I'm, I'm actually thinking of my best friend from sixth grade, whose son is on the spectrum and also diagnosed bipolar, and they have had the worst year of their lives. And so I've had very, very intense exposure to the rigid treatment that they have had to do since he was very young and then he self-destructed at 19. Um, and I would like to take something away from this talk and I'm sure many people in the room are affected or know someone with who's on the spectrum in some way, it's so common. Uh, what is this narrative therapy mm -hmm. and what are the outcomes? Um, so I don't know that I, I can't speak to the outcomes. Um, I can speak to what I understand about the approach and, and how, it's, uh, how it differs from maybe more, more conventional approaches to psychotherapy. Um, what, what really drew me initially to this was I, you know, and I've been in and out of sort of, um, you know, my, my background has been one where I've uh, been a student of the humanities for some time and then a, a physician and a researcher and, and then now, a, you know, I'm very much organizational and business side. And um, what drew me initially to this uh, therapeutic approach, which is referred to as narrative therapy, and more specifically, in, at San Diego State University, there's a group of marriage and family therapists who have coined the term narrative neurotherapy as an alternative to narrative psychotherapy. Um, and, and they've found it helpful to, to think about neural mechanisms related to learning and how we think about um, the way that conditions and contexts affect, affect learning. So they've coined that term because they feel it's a little bit more useful than to think of conventional psychotherapy. But um, what drew me to it really was that it, some of its um, philosophical underpinnings come from social construction and discussing problems as constructs, disorders, diseases, as constructs that we've come to understand and where alternative explanations are possible. And from those alternative explanations, different actions can be taken. And there are greater possibilities for change. So that's the model that we found to be so helpful, rather than one which, for example, takes the individual and labels. So many labels are currently applied to individuals who have developmental disabilities, whether you know, they may have an underlying diagnosis of autism with intellectual developmental disorder. Mm -hmm. and on top of that, be, be labeled as having depression and anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder and bipolar disorder. This, this happens. And all just, it is is labeling. It's, it's all labeling. And um, as a clinician, you're just not sure how helpful that is. In fact, you see the harmful effects of that. So um, I apologize, that, Chai, that I can't speak to outcomes research. Um, my sense, too, is that the kinds of maybe randomized controlled trials as an approach to researching this would not be so helpful, but in fact, it's, um, you know, so it's, other, uh, it's other ways of exploring these ideas, historical and otherwise, that might be more helpful. Thanks a lot. Um, I have a philosophical question that pertains to topics of evidence and theory in neuroscience. Let's say that you do many studies that you think for psychological reasons pertain to conflict, and you find that a similar neural structure, like the interior cingulate cortex, becomes active in these tasks. So you come to associate in some way anterior cingulate cortex with conflict. Then you study a new behavior that you don't think involves conflict at all, but you see ACC activity. Now, there's two possible conclusions that you could draw from that. One, your psychological theory is wrong. The new behavior that you didn't think involved conflict does indeed involve conflict. Or maybe your neuroscience theory is wrong. The ACC shouldn't be thought of in terms of conflict at all. And the question is, how do you distinguish between those two conclusions? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think that's a good example of where labeling 
leads us astray. And actually, if you look at the conflict work on ACC, it's not always the same region. You were getting subgenual cingulate stuff during Stroop early on. Then you were getting area 24. Some study, studies show 32. It also shows up, cingulate shows up in many emotion studies and vicarious pain. So cingulate is doing lots of stuff related to behavior and motivation. The construct of conflict, conflict gets operationalized in different ways. So I think as soon as you have a label, there's a temptation to say, oh, that lit up. Therefore, part of our explanatory mechanism, part of our psychologically labeled flowchart of this behavior should include conflict and have the conflict box. I think that the sense that there's an, a pressure to do that from this data is already a sign of a mistake. Um, I don't think we'll ever get that kind of discrete labeling of any structure in the nervous system, because I don't think brains work that way. So I, I agree with that. Um, but I can imagine um, thinking sociologically that conflict is an extremely rich, positive relation that people have with each other. Um, and so if, if in my other, you know, the other thing, um, I could also characterize as an extremely rich, positive relation, um, that I would be more convinced that it was conflict. We just don't tend to think of conflict as that. That's what I'm saying, you know, that, that that's what conflict is. Yeah. Uh, Stuart Dambrot. Um, uh, I guess I could call myself an inconveniently transdisciplinarian individual. Um, and hence these questions. There are two areas, and hence two questions, that weren't mentioned, and I wanted to see what the panel, starting in both cases with Jesse, uh, if, it had, if, if it would have any value. Uh, the first is evolutionary neurobiology. Uh, we share, depending on the study, 96 to 99 percent of our genome with uh, our genetic makeup with chimpanzees. We also so happen to share a great many uh, behaviors. Uh, we also share a social structure, a uh, hierarchical and uh, an alpha-based uh, hierarchy. Uh, so given that, and given that uh, genetics gives rise to, it gives expression to neural tissue, it would seem that that could be an alternate avenue for investigating uh, by mapping differences and similarities, uh, identifying areas that might have a role in the social application of neuroscience. So that's one Second uh, is more a philosophical question, um, and that is having to do with the relationship between perception and the subsequent understanding of what was perceived and whether it's mapped or understood as belief versus knowledge. Uh, so and I think this has to do with the confusion in general between induction and deduction. Uh, so we have a predilection to identify a pattern ask why, and then do whatever we need to do to come up with an answer because we can't stand not having one. So we then get that answer, and if we are aware that it is probabilistic, an induction, that's great. But if it's believed as to be a fact, we have some of the symptoms that have been addressed today uh, in the panel. And I would just like comments on both of those, again, start with every, from everyone if possible, if there's time, but starting with Jesse. Just quickly on chimps, I, I think we have um, exactly nothing to learn from chimp behavior. The only thing closer to a um, pan troglodyte than a homo sapiens sapiens is a pan paniscus. And pan paniscus has sexual behaviors, social behaviors, levels of violence, levels of dietary um, accrual that very much differ from its extremely close relative, the common chimp. I think there are just huge dangers there. If you look at human violence, there is massive variation ac across the species, across incidents. So I, I, d I just don't think there's a, a lot we can learn. We, there's nothing to infer from, from looking at a chimp that we couldn't learn more directly from studying us. And with us, the rule is variation. You know, I mean, so the most, vi does anyone know what the most violent rec uh, riot in US history is? It was here in New York. It was during the Civil War and was a result of the draft and recent Irish immigrants started lynching people like crazy and killing uh, their neighbors because they didn't want to be drafted to fight a war they didn't care about. 
So to understand explosions of violence without knowing the history, the demography, with the, the cultural background of these individuals, the cultural conditions, what they were trying to express, we will gain no purchase on this. Adrian Rain, who's speaking in the next session, wants to re resuscitate Lombroso-style criminology. And when you look cross-nationally at, at differences in violence, you look at uh, mass incarceration here and the rates of handgun violence compared to socioeconomically comparative populations or regional differences between North and South, you realize how hopeless it is to be taking these biological routes to explanation. It's not that they have nothing to contribute. It's just that time is limited. And if we want to understand why the world is on fire, studying the, the, the genes and the circuitry here won't help showing that apes are violent too and saying we're born violent um, is even worse. So I want to get us further and further away from that kind of explanation and argue for a, a richer, more, more textured, and much more particularistic um, approach to understanding of behavior. Yeah, understood. So well, any thoughts on the second one at, at all? Uh, it's all uh, induction. <laughs> Yes, that's it. <laughs> so I'll just say, you know, because I had cute pictures of chimps, that was for a reason, and um, not just because I wanted to um, have monkeys on, on a slide. Um, if you're interested in social life, then you're interested in social animals, and humans and chimps and a very few other social animals are, are characterized by the fact that they don't occupy fixed roles. So all ants are social animals, but they occupy fixed roles. And so what's interesting about humans is the fact that they, and, and also chimps and a few, a very small number of social animals is that they have moments of isolation and moments of sociability. And so as, as new, as people, as humans, or those kinds of social animals enter into new groups, they have to be able to do what Daphne did right away, which is to read who the crowd is and understand who's there who's paying attention to whom, what the social structure is. Otherwise, that, if you can't read that, if you can't read a social structure effectively, then you're not gonna be able to act very effectively in it. So I really do believe that the capacity to navigate social structure, that is to read it, is something that is, um, it makes sense to think about uh, as a fundamental human property. I don't care whether it comes from chimps or not, but it comes from the fact of the oscillation of isolation and sociability that's characteristic of our species. Thank you. Uh, I have a peculiar historical note. Um, I understood and perhaps misunderstood the first speaker to speak about the relationship between liking at one time and liking at another time. Um, believe it or not, 65 years ago at Columbia, at the Bureau of Applied Social Research, we did a study which involved the influence of liking on action. The question was, how do physicians uh, learn about a new drug? And we did a relatively uh, novel thing. We interviewed all the doctors in four different communities and not only asked them what they did about using a new drug, but we asked them about with whom they played golf and with whom they had coffee and things like that and we could map a whole lot of sociometric relations within each of these doctors' communities. Sure. And then we discovered that indeed, the starting a new, using a new drug depended on who your friends were. Yeah, and I mean, um, so, I know and Coleman, that, and I know any cats. I might say. No, I don't think so. I know Coleman, I know cats, but are you Menzel? Yeah, sure. What a treat to meet you. you know, I'm not, I'm not Menzel. Oh, you're not Menzel. No, but I worked with him. Yeah, okay. I mean, of course, I mean, look, you know, it, that's, it's great to know, you know, there's a long tradition in sociology of understanding how social networks, 
and social relations influence social behavior. So just to be clear, you know, we're, we're not challenging that. We're saying in addition to all the things that we know, which are actually now quite, quite developed from Coleman Katz Menzel 1956, um, in addition to those dynamics, we, also can, we can also detect a signature months earlier of a future affective state. That's all. Uh, okay, good. Uh, I, I have a background of theoretical physics, so I try to give some uh, ideas about uh, lacking. So lacking is, 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 is some kind of interaction between two persons or two particles if I use the language of physics. So this interaction will you know, lower the energy of the system. So that, that's make the, you know, Anyway, it uh, makes the system very comfortable. Yeah, this is one point. So I, I have another comment to the second speaker. So uh, this speaker mentioned the oscillation and the vibration. Exactly, I think there also are resonance. The resonance, uh, when the person see the image, so they have the, the resonance between the two vibrations. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I'm right on, wrong or right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm not 100% sure I understood the comment, but if, if I understood you to say that, that what's happening in the, the paper that we're, we you know, described very briefly is that there's interdependence in the construction of a fundamental sociological phenomenon called reciprocity, the answer is yes, and that that, that has macro level significance for how the social structure holds together, the answer also is yes. If I didn't understand the question, sorry. I mean, just quickly on oscillations, I was being very, very fast and loose there, but people often talk about oscillations and they talk about synchrony, usually it's phase locking, not synchrony necessarily. Um, whether it's the oscillations that are functional or the, the collective behavior, even what causes the oscillations, is it is it axon potentials? Is it is it something dendritic? Is it functional or epiphenomenal? All those are very tough and, and unresolved questions for research. Even something as question as how individual neurons code for something like a color. If you look at a pyramidal cell coding for red and a pyramidal cell coding for green, the cells look the same. They fire at similar rates and the amplitudes look similar. So figuring out what in the neurodynamics are actually carrying signal, and it probably varies from domain to domain, um, all those are really some of the most interesting unre unresolved questions. So I was being quite, quite loose there. Um, so I'm uh, Jochen Weber. I'm uh, originally with Psychology in Colombia, now with the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute. Um, and I'm just curious whether some of the uh, issues with the silos between, let's say, uh, neuroscience and more, let's say, society or uh, sociology uh, is uh, the, the disappointment of people who look at neuroscience from the outside and um, then f neuroscientists who once again uh, hear what comes from the outside back and there's just this misunderstanding. So for instance, one thing that people from the outside may want neuroscience to be able to do is see a behavior like autism and then say, okay, we see this behavior and we know what's wrong with the brain. Just like uh, here's a car and it has this behavior and it uh, motor sputters or something and we know exactly where to look and then we can fix it. And neuroscience is nowhere near there, I think. And people have just to acknowledge that if, if they want neuroscience to do that, then they actually have to pay neuroscience more money, not less. Uh, <laughs> right? So it, because I do think we're still very much at the basics. And there's so many layers of analysis. And maybe um, all three of you can comment on whether you actually agree that neuroscience gets too much funding or, as I would say, still too little. Because if we at some point want to get there, to see someone's behavior and then have at least some clue as to what's happening, I think we need more funding. <laughs> well, I think maybe the, the types of projects that are funded. So maybe not, you know, 171 studies of depression, but a few particular ones that are designed with more, um, more interdisciplinary um, input. I would. Silos and to get challenges so that 
we, that neuroscience gets the challenges from you guys that say, hey, here's something that we want to understand with neuroscience. Let's work together. Let's come up with a study that helps us understand how it works. Because I do agree that if neuroscientists may live in their silo and think, oh, that's another cute thing that we could do with the neurons, and oh, let's, let's try this little thing. And it's all interesting. But then we may not find out how actual behaviors work. So yes, please challenge neuroscientists and come up with great experiments together. So I just I want to say first, um, you know, he won't admit, but he's a co-author of one of our papers. So, um, <laughs> so we're going to out you. But you, we really shouldn't be sitting wondering whether um, neuroscience is getting more funding than, than population health or something else. Um, we're just fighting amongst ourselves. The real battle is actually um, the vast uh, expenditure of U.S. funds for instruments of death, torture, and the, the destruction of the world. So, you know, we should be happy that neuroscience is getting the money they're getting, and we could just want from a little bit more. Yeah, I have a question um, primarily for Peter. It would be interesting to hear the views of the other panelists like too. So, philosophers of science draw a distinction between context of discovery and context of explanation. And um, you this striking discovery you have that um, your partner's evaluation of you predicts your future life. Um, there's, a, there's a weaker position which is, couldn't have been found without neuroscience, and there's a stronger position that you actually need to mention neuroscience in an explanation of the phenomena. So context of discovery is one thing, contribution to explanation is another. Um, is your position the weaker one or the stronger one? What, what are your reasons for saying one of those two, if you want to say one of those two? It's, it's, it's absolutely minimally the weaker one. Um, we, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't have found this without a very specific design. That's what you um, said, yeah. Yeah, it's simply impossible to find without a very specific design. And then the second, just clarify again the second. The stronger position would be that, of course, there's going to be some neural realization of the, um, uh, the effect of your... Um, of your partner's evaluation somehow operates on you and somewhere or other there's going to be... But if you ask what's the sociological, what's the psychological explanation of this, of this phenomena and its effect on um, dyads and all the later social mechanisms and network phenomena you mentioned, um, uh, we know it must have some realisation, but that particularization doesn't really affect the kinds of explanation that a social network theorist like you would, would offer. So there would be a claim about mode of discovery rather than explanation. That would be... Yeah, I'm curious as to what Noam thinks, but um, but I I'm, I think I would stick with the weaker explanation. We we really don't yeah. have a mechanism um, uh, by by uh, which this is really operating over the time resolutions that we have. Um, there's some kind of phenotypic drip, um, but we don't know what that is. Yeah. Maybe Jesse has a comment too. I um, I of course really like the question, and I I do think. Um, we should be asking that question with, with each of these discoveries. I think in principle there will be certain ones where the psychological level explanation just gives out. So the examples of the optical illusions um, were like that. There are things like, what's the minimal duration required for a stimulus presentation to have a conscious percept? And I don't think that's going to be a psychological story. I think it's going to have something to do with the, the neuromechanism. But there are going to be lots of cases like the stuff Suzanne works out where we don't know yet. We don't know, is it a mechanistic explanation, something about the machine, or is it going to be something about the psychology, or both? We don't even have good theoretical tools for thinking how the two, how multi-level explanation works, how mechanism and psychological factors can, can interact. So we can list them as interaction terms in, a, in an equation, but thinking about means is something that eludes us. So I think if we're not making that question part of our theory construction process, we'll, we'll miss out on a lot here. Maybe I'll just add, you know, Newcomb um, uh, had, a, had a kind of beautiful idea um, uh, which actually does center on, on the reward that we get from interaction with other people. And I think the, the, the sentence that um, he uses is something, if we, if we get reward from being with somebody, we, we will then maybe have more duets with them or play more tennis with them. And so there is a self-reinforcing process um, we just haven't captured that in this design. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was a, I, uh, 
I was glad that I put everybody on the spot. I think it, it made a, a, a really lively and animated discussion. And uh, I hope you, the rest of you, enjoyed the discussion just as much as I did. I, uh, let's join in thanking the speakers once again. And thanking, thanking all of you for coming, but most of all, for thanking Andrew and Lan for having organized this wonderful event. Professor Dawson, just by a few words of conclusion, uh, with this seminar, you know, we hope to raise some of the in practice and in principle questions that arise when integrating neuroscience with other fields of scholarship. So we hope that we have indeed raised some questions in this uh, discussion, and that the discussion will be ongoing. Um, but yeah, and and finally, just from all the crosstalk in the room, we've discussed something about um, critique, curiosity, but then also crisis and disagreement compromise, and then finally this resolution of collaboration. So hopefully we can combine all five of these different conflicting social and theoretical questions. So thank you so much for coming, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks. And there's a reception. Please help yourself to wine and crackers.